This is New York Today, WBGO's award-winning call-in show. We're discussing the issues affecting New Jersey's largest city. And now your host, Andrew Meyer. The school year is less than a week old. Students in Newark are settling into their new classes. A lot of them, their parents, maybe even their teachers, wondering what changes are in store for the year. Tonight, it's a chance to find all that out. We are pleased to welcome back to the program the head of the Newark Public Schools, Superintendent Cami Anderson. Good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. And we do have one other guest, our regular guest, and that's you. Do you have a question about the new school year? Are you a student, a parent, a teacher? You can call us at 1-800-499-9246. That's 1-800-499-9246. You can email us at newarktoday at wbgo.org. You can also join the conversation on social media at facebook.com slash newarktoday. And on Twitter, you can follow me at Andrew Meyer WBGO. Right off the bat, school year is one week old. How's everything going? Any surprises so far? Thankfully, no. Um, We had a great launch. This is the start of my third school year, so um, we felt great about all of the important pieces in terms of family communication, operations, being fully staffed, having our principals in place, having our curriculum ready, our materials ready. So these are all things that, you know, when they don't happen, folks notice, but when they do, Um, It feels seamless, and I think we had a a super opening, and we feel great about our start to the year. Now, it didn't take long for politics to get into the mix. Uh, Steve Lonigan, the Republican candidate in the special election for U.S. Senate seat, gave voice yesterday to a complaint about the new education standards called the Common Core. The Common Core education standards coming out of this Department of Education are designed not just to dumb down education, but also to facilitate what every kid in this country will learn, teaching to the test. Education initiatives get dressed up in fancy names. That's a lot of times don't really tell the whole story. What is the Common Core and why is it not a dumbing down of our system as as Steve Lonigan would contend? I'm so glad you gave me an opportunity to answer this question because I've been in education for 20 years and I actually think the Common Core standards are one of the most important and promising things that have come um, into the education movement since I've been since I've been at it. Fundamentally, what they have done, which is incredible, and all countries that have gotten high performing results for all students have a common set of standards that articulate very clearly what students need to know and be able to do. In the U.S., we've had very disparate standards so that, for example, in Tennessee, you could obtain a diploma that is tantamount to sixth grade mastery. And in New York City, you could obtain a diploma that was tantamount to say ninth grade mastery. What this did was it created a fractured market in terms of curriculum. It also really confused families. What are my kids supposed to do? We now have one common set of standards that are in fact more rigorous. So much harder to attain, but actually are far greater research so that we know that if our students master it, they'll do well in college and career. So this is a this is a big breakthrough and I think and teachers love it. Teachers love it because they now say we can see how what we teach in second grade is related to what we teach in third grade and it's starting to change the quality of materials because imagine with one set of standards an exemplary second grade teacher in Oregon can share a lesson plan with an exemplary second grade teacher here in Newark, New Jersey. This is a great thing. It is it is clarifying things for families. It's inspiring teachers to share. And it's a best practice among nations that have frankly done much better than the U.S. So um, we're committed to it and we've very much embraced it. And if you want further clarification and if you have the time, you can find all this information out. There's a website out there that really breaks it down. It is grade by grade, year by year, and really goes into quite a bit of detail. If you have the time, if you want to find out more, it's out there for anybody to check out. Absolutely. And the Council of Great City Schools and the National PTA have also put out family-friendly versions of the Common Core, and they're excellent. So if a third grade parent wants to find out precisely what the Common Core asks of their kid, you can go to the Council of Great City Schools website, the National PTA. It's a real blueprint so that families, teachers, and communities can come together and say, this is what our young people need to know to succeed. And it's quite clear and quite rigorous, 
and I'm excited that um, the teachers and students in Newark have really embraced them. This is Newark Today in WBGO and WBGO.org. Our show tonight is all about education in Newark. Our guest, the superintendent of the Newark Public Schools, Cami Anderson, got a question for her about anything education-related. You can call us at 1-800-499-9246. That's 1-800-499-9246. Our first call of the night actually came in a couple of hours ago, a message left by Rosalind in Newark. Let's listen to her question. I have a nephew to just call me panicking um, because Harriet Tubman is a regular public school that had after school coverage for their children that the parents paid for it was not free. And the superintendent, the, the superintendent has told the parent, I told the school that they can no longer use that facility after school. So my nephew had to leave work an hour early to go pick up his daughter from Harriet Tubman School. Hopefully, that can be the question of why has she discontinued. The child is six years old. The school goes from kindergarten to sixth grade. So those are parents who work. They work, most of them. Um, So why does she do it without even a notice? Rosalind, a member of WBGO, left that message on our voicemail earlier today. A two-part question. Number one, um, why was this discontinued? And it seems like also there was a breakdown in communication. So um, I'm afraid to say that uh, I don't know because it's not true. So I have, this, this came to my attention today in our office. Uh, there appears to be some... Uh, major miscommunication. This is not an initiative out of my office. This was not a directive from my office. Um, As far as I know, the Harriet Tubman School is operating as it should be and has been expected. So we're happy to follow up with Rosalind directly. And and literally, we just became aware that there were any concerns about this a couple of hours ago. So we will happily follow up with Rosalind directly. Who should Rosalind get in touch with since since she just left the message? Sure. Anyone who has questions about this or anything else um, can call 973-733-7333. That number will get you directly to the superintendent's office and whomever needs to be um, responding to the call will do so. Number again, 973-733-7333. Rosalind, thank you so much for calling earlier today. We are going next to the phones now, and Kawanda is actually live with us on the program. She's joining us first up tonight. Kawanda, welcome to Newark today. What's your question for Superintendent Anderson? Uh, uh, uh-huh. I, I, I want to ask the superintendent, what is going on at uh, Clinton, Clinton Avenue School? The, uh, they, they closed the school down. Um, last week, because it uh, had mold in it, and, uh, and the people saying uh, asbestos in it, too, and, you know, nobody t- nobody told the parents, you know, nobody sent the parents a letter or nothing, and then they got there, and they told them they had to put the kids on bus and take them somewhere else. My question is, why do you keep putting kids in that school, and our building's no good? The building was closed down before because it was no good. And these kids are, are little kids, three, four, five-year-old kids, and, uh, and why do you, you keep putting them in that building? Just put them somewhere else, please. Kawanda, thanks for your question. We did decide to move the young people, or the little people, I should say, to a new location. When we opened the the school as an early childhood center, and it's in a very high needs neighborhood, so we had enroll we have enrolled over two hundred over two hundred little people, and we, and that's because it's a very high needs neighborhood. And of course, we always have limited options. That school, we did extensive testing when we opened it. Uh, back up. And, you know, recently we've begun to get some um, testing results for mold that are above the levels that we would want to see. So we did make the decision to bus the children. We did, in this instance, we we absolutely executed a very robust communications plan. We had electronic calls. We had phone trees. We had parents calling parents. We had uh, individuals at the school to greet families who who did not receive those messages. And so we were able to move them to a new location. We're providing free busing and we will keep the children at the new location of the new site as long as we need to, to ensure the safety and well-being of those young people where, so that they stay. Where is the new site? Um, it's it's close to Westside High School. It's a, a building called that used to be Morton Street and that was Westside NAF, but I, I can't recall the exact address. Um, but if, if um, the 
Uh, is well, let me ask you the the question with the school itself, the Clinton Avenue School. Mm-hmm. Is it salvageable if there've been these continuing problems? So the, it it was open for for two years with all the tests being positive. I think it's too early to tell, but rest assured, we will not put children in a school that isn't safe. And that's why we made the decision to move them to a temporary location. The challenge is that there isn't another facility close by. So um, we made the investment to upgrade the space and to ensure that it was safe. It, It is safe, it was safe. And when we began to get levels we weren't comfortable with, we made the decision for a temporary location. And this is often the case where you have to trade off geographic um, proximity for the the best interest of children. So it was a good decision that the site they're in now will remain open for as long as is necessary to ensure the safety of our of our children. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org to join the conversation. Like Kawanda just did, if you have your own question about the schools, you can call us at 1-800-499-9246. That's 1-800-499-9246. Going back to the phones now, they are loading up. James is joining us on the program. James, welcome to New York Today. It's it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Ms. Anderson. How are you? How are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I just wanted to, before I ask a question, just to uh, wish you and all the New York teachers continued success. Thank you very much. uh, You're welcome. And my question this evening is this. uh, What is the best part? Or what do you think the best part of your job uh, as superintendent? Gosh, there's so many great things. I would say, hands down, visiting classrooms and seeing teachers teach and students learn. I'm a schools person by temperament, by desire, by heart. And most people will tell you that at least two, three days a week, I'm out in schools. And when I'm in schools, I'm in classrooms. I'm talking to teachers. I'm watching them teach. I'm talking to kids families, and I have a deep passion and love of schools, and that's why I'm blessed to be in a profession that has me out and about and seeing the real work being done on the ground every day, the effort of those teachers, the the beauty of watching when a, a little person gets a concept, and families who come every day that want the best for their kids. So being in schools on a weekly basis feeds my soul, and it's, it's what I got into the work to do, and it's why I, it keeps me going every day. We have a follow-up question coming in from Anne now, uh, who I believe is going to give you a little bit of a chance, uh, Ms. Anderson, to tout your own horn. Anne, welcome to Newark today. Anne is actually not there, uh, so I will ask, actually uh, pop in with Anne's question, which was, um, she wants to know what your biggest accomplishment has been to date, in your opinion. Great question. I think we are beginning to have a a very clear set of goals around which everyone is rallying. Um, And by that, I mean stakeholders and families and teachers and principals um, and advocates and partners. I think we have a good sense of where we are in terms of graduation rates and students reading on grade level and attendance. And believe it or not, that took a lot of work. But I also feel like we have a real sense of possibility of where we can go. And I'm feeling a lot of um, coherence and cohesion around our ability to just attain big things for our kids. I think that sense of possibility and the collective will and the collective commitment to our young people, while it's slightly intangible, to me feels like um, a great accomplishment and one that's not complete, but I'm starting to see the momentum and the commitment to what's possible. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. Our guest tonight, the head of the Newark Public Schools, Cami Anderson. You can get in here with your own question at 1-800-499-9246. That's 1-800-499-9246. Uh, the Newark schools have been under state control since 1995. You're the fifth person to head up the schools during that time. But you got a vote of confidence from the governor last week when he and the education commissioner were both asked if they planned to renew your contract. Yes, we do, and we're gonna renew it because she's done a great job, and I don't care about the community criticism. We run the school district in Newark, not them. It's good to have the vote of confidence, but when it comes to working with the community, it's to your advantage to work with the entire community, not just the ones who are patting you on the back, right? 100%, I mean, 
anyone who knows me knows that I actually believe criticism and difficult conversations are a an essential part of change and of doing this job well. Much of what drew me to Newark is the passion of the residents, and passion can be support, it can be constructive criticism, it can be flat out disagreement. Most great changes and great things and transformational results were not attained um, through easy conversations. Um, I'm someone who welcomes that. It's a deep commitment of mine. And from day one, I have been out and about, and I will continue to be out and about working with the community because I believe they are part of the solution. They must be part of the solution. And that in order to get breakthrough results, we're going to have some difficult conversations. And if we aren't having them, then we're not going to get where we need to go. And you can still find common ground with members, uh, some members of the school advisory board, the elected but simply advisory um, council, um, some of whom have been antagonistic to you. Absolutely, we need to find common ground. We find common ground all the time. Politics is politics and education is education. And I believe that the members of the school advisory board ran for those ran for that office and sit on the advisory board because they believe in kids. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but we have found many ways to work together. And again, I welcome the healthy dissension and the healthy debate. And as long as we all keep kids at the core, which I believe the advisory board members do, then we will find ways to break through and to make sure that our kids are learning. At the end of the day, that is what we were all charged to do. That's why they ran. That's why I'm here. This is Newark Today on WBGO, WBGO.org. You can also find us online there. We're having a conversation tonight, a constructive dialogue with the head of the Newark Public Schools, Cami Anderson, and we welcome you, welcome you into this conversation. You can call us at 1-800-499-9246. Janet is next up on the line. Janet, welcome to Newark Today. What's your question for the superintendent? Good evening, um, Superintendent Anderson. Good evening, Hello. Janet. I really appreciate what you're doing in the district and changing things, but I just have a question for you. I know that you're being reappointed as superintendent. What have you learned from your experience thus far, and what do you think you will do differently in your new term? Good question. These are always hard to answer in sound bites. <laughs> How much time do you have? I've learned so much. Um, I guess I'll share uh, one thing that's near and dear to my heart, which is I, I believe that change happens at the school level, and I think we must do even more in my second term to ensure we have a great leader at every school, which I think we've made great progress in, but we're still not there. That, that leader has enough leeway to make the decisions they think are best for the school because not every community is the same and one size does not fit all and that they are empowered to recruit, select, train, coach, hire, and support an all-star cast of teachers. So as far as learning, I think that as a bureaucracy, um, our central team sometimes gets in the way of that kind of theory of change. And while I think we've taken strides in cutting down on the bureaucracy and, and preventing the kind of leadership I just described, I think we have a long way to go so that we actually have individuals at every school who are transformational leaders and feel like they have the support and coaching and are not held back by bureaucratic barriers that prevent success. And I've always been committed to that, but something that I'm going to bring with me uh, as a renewed sense of passion in my second term, if you will, is um, our laser-like focus in stopping some of the bureaucratic pieces from preventing transformational leadership, which is what I think we need at every school. In English, what does that mean? So things like, um, I want to be able to hire person X, but the rules say I can't. Things like, um, I would like to be able to um, have a back to school night on X date, but someone at central office told me I can't. Things like, I believe this student needs another year of ESL services, but some policy somewhere said we only give two years of ESL services. And it's looking for willing partners. 100%. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. When we come back, more with Newark School Superintendent Cami Anderson.
Each text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back to the program. I'm Andrew Meyer. Newark Today is more than radio. You can now watch the program as it's on. You can find our live video stream on our website at wbgo.org slash Newark Today. And if you are watching us online tonight, you'll see that our guest tonight, Cammie Anderson, the head of the Newark Public Schools. I want to take some time here for a few questions on public safety in the schools, specifically about a new program that's being rolled out called Zero Tolerance for Zero Tolerance. Um, another catchy title. One of our guests on our last program was Newark Police Director Sam DeMeo. Uh, we asked him about the program. You know, you have a kid that's being irate, a kid that's being unbehaved. The answer is not to grab him, lock him up, and take him out of school. The answer is, what does this student need? Maybe he needs to sit down with the school resource officer after school and be counseled on what the problem may be. You know, taking it to another level, where the police are not just there to, okay, we're here, there's a problem, we're going to arrest somebody. The new program. Whose idea was it? Uh, the districts, the departments, both? It's definitely a collaboration. It's a true collaboration. Um, in my former um, life, I was the superintendent of alternative high schools, and I had the opportunity to work with the Institute of Restorative Practices before. And what they do is they teach adults, whether they're law enforcement officers or uh, teachers, principals, how to de-escalate conflict, how to get to the root of what caused the conflict, how to respond in a way that actually allows the young person to own their mistake and move on, and then how to ensure that the rest of the community, so in this case the kids, can receive them back and give them a chance to own up so that the entire community can move on. Why is that important? Because if you keep on tamping down conflict without getting to the root of it and helping the young person process it and the community process it, it's gonna keep popping back up. So it's a very powerful framework or tool, if you will, to train any adult that cares about young people around how to respond to conflict and misbehavior in a way that is about empowering them and moving on and owning up to mistakes so that they can get on to learning and they can lead a productive life. It's the opposite of either sort of tamping down a conflict in a superficial way, which doesn't work because it just pops back up, or being extremely punitive in a way that never allows the adult to really understand what happened so they can get to the bottom of how to fix it. Udi Ofer, the head of the ACLU of New Jersey, was also on the last program. Uh, he did express some concerns. I'm always wary when uh, a, a, a police department becomes involved in school discipline issues without having clear guidelines in place as to what can a police officer do and what they cannot do. So it all comes down to training. Right. I mean, with all due respect, you know, this is exactly why we're doing it. Police officers are involved in schools. So let me just give you one statistic from a recent national study of the young people who are arrested nationally. This is not in Newark. 70% um, of them are African-American. So when something happens in schools, what happens? The school calls the police. They are involved in schools. So what we're saying is let's actually work together to create a framework that is about relationships, partnerships, anger de-escalation, conflict resolution, respect for young people, and a peer culture that allows for us to solve problems as opposed to arresting. Law enforcement must be involved in schools. They are involved in schools because it's part of basic safety. What we're doing is flipping the script and saying, we're actually embracing what um, this advocate is talking about. We're saying that restorative practices and the training that we provided is in fact laying out a very clear guideline for how all the adults work together so that you don't have some adults sending a message about the ability to recover and learn from your mistakes and other adults simply being called at the point of conflict that leads to arrest, which we know leads to a lot, uh, a much higher likelihood of court involvement. So in fact, what we're doing is responding directly to the concern that law enforcement only plays a punitive role. When that happens, we know what the outcome is. When law enforcement is brought in on the front end to understand that part of their role is to ensure that a young person can actually own up to what they did wrong and move on, that's a game changer. 
This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. The whole show is all about the Newark Public Schools and what's best for the kids. Our guest tonight, Newark School Superintendent Cami Anderson, and of course you. You can join the conversation by calling us at 1-800-499-9246. It's 1-800-499-9246. Going back to the phones now, Andrews is joining us on the program. Welcome to Newark Today. What's your question for the superintendent? Thank you. It's actually a two-part question. The first question is, what are your plans for the upcoming school year with regards to safety in the high school? And I also want to know if you can give us three accomplishments that you've made in the city of Newark for the Newark school system. Great. So the first question obviously picks up on where we were. What we did is we formed teams in every high school, and the teams included student advocates, teachers, the principal, the school security officer, social workers, and each of those teams underwent a week-long training, which that that in and of itself is a, a huge breakthrough around restorative practices. And those teams are putting together a new kind of safety plan, part of which is responding to crises unfortunately, such as the one we've seen to make sure that our kind of technical work on safety is in, in order in the event, you know, God forbid, we have some of the situations we've seen in schools across the country. But the other part of the work was putting in place a relationship plan so that we're building cultures in schools where conflicts get de-escalated and resolved and, and where we get to the root of what's going on before it bubbles up again. That kind of collaborative approach with teams is happening in every single one of our high schools. And it, it's a first of its kind collaboration. And our our theory is that it will help young people to succeed, not just in school, but in life. Because when we take the opposite approach, we end up suspending far more students than we would like to, disproportionately male, disproportionately males of color. And that leads to what we call the school to prison pipeline. Schools contribute to that. So this is a direct response to what is a national problem around the overrepresentation of African American and Latino boys in the suspension pipeline, which leads to court involvement? So this was a big commitment, and we also believe it's educationally sound because obviously, if a young person is in school learning, they're going to get ahead much faster than if they're pulled out of a school for a disciplinary issue. The other uh, question, the two part of that uh, Andrews had, was uh, on your accomplishments. You're being graded tonight, I, I get a sense. People want to know what you think your accomplishments are. Fair enough. I think our Breakthrough Teachers contract was a huge accomplishment. Uh, we have uh, a lot to do on implementation, but we did um, a, a great thing. Uh, the Teachers Union is to be commended collaborated with us in laying out a blueprint beyond it's it's not a contract it literally is a blueprint a whole new way of thinking about how uh, principals and teachers should work together in the service of student achievement so that i felt was significant the other thing um, we built out our office of community and family engagement i am a firm believer that families must be partners in their child's education and there's nothing that makes me more frustrated than when i hear uh, school officials say, well, you know, families just don't get involved as if we have nothing to say about it. So there are a lot of things that schools can do to break down barriers between the school and the home. So we rolled out a whole new set of tools, family-friendly walkthroughs to bring par parents into schools, a framework for whether or not we believe schools are actually family-friendly that we're using to literally do spot visits, the ways we recruit and train family liaisons, so we have a whole piece around family engagement because it is my belief that families must and can be involved and that schools do a lot of things to prevent that and we must actually make progress. And third, I would say definitely among our principal and leadership core and the people who are coaching and leading our principals, again, the unit of change where it all happens is the school. You have to have a transformational leader, someone who believes in their heart and soul that every kid can achieve, backs it up with action, knows instruction, has good curricula, has the right resources at their fingertips. And so I think on that third piece, on having a great leader in every building, we've made tremendous strides in how we've recruited those folks, how we've trained those folks, how we support those folks. At the end of the day, if we don't have an awesome principal in every school, we will not have breakthrough results. And from what I remember, when you first started a few years ago, when you hit the ground running, that was one of the first things you did was you pulled all the principals together, 100%. correct? 100%. We have a uh, meeting every month with the principals. It is an entire day, but it is not about stand and deliver. It is about 
real deep work around training, goal setting. And my first year, I did a good deal of that training myself. You know, my background is in, in leadership training and coaching. So my first year, I, I personally did a good deal of that training. Last year, as our team became more robust um, and skilled, the we, we spread it around. This year, I'm, I'm kind of going back home a little, and I've done a lot more um, of the training again myself because it is my belief that if we have transformational leaders at the helm of every school, we will see breakthrough results. And I believe that um, we have to recruit, select, train, coach, and manage principles in that manner. Because if we get compliant principles or incremental principles or principles who are waiting for me to tell them what to do, then we are not going to see dramatic gains. This is Newark Today on WBHO and WBHO.org. Our guest tonight, Newark School Superintendent Cami Anderson. If you have a question for her, you can call us at one 800 499 Nine two four six. It's one eight hundred four nine 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 two four six. You can also email us your question at Newark Today at WBTO dot org. Back to the phones now. Miss Childs is joining us on the program. Welcome to Newark Today. What's your question for the superintendent? Hi, thank you. I was interested to know. I've seen a lot in the news recently about the absenteeism issue. Why is this so important to you? Thanks for the question. We, I'm glad you've seen a lot in the news. We, um, you know, hit hit the streets, hit the schools. A big kickoff with the start of the new school hit year. Hit the churches. Um, uh, we s- released a study um, over the summer about um, absenteeism in Newark. So first, let me just say why it's important. How often a child attends school and how frequently and whether or not they're present and on time is directly related to how well they do in school and that's directly related to how often they graduate, which is directly related to whether they're able to go on to college and have all the options they deserve, which is to say attendance matters greatly. We have something in education called time on task. That means the amount of minutes you are spending doing the thing that's going to help you grow. So also tardiness matters and leaving early matters. So we think a lot about how do we increase the time on task? The greatest schools in Newark and in this country have more time on task than those that don't. They have longer days, but it's not just they have longer days. When the students are in school, they're they're on time and they come consistently. So improving attendance is a critical goal in helping to get our young people ahead. Right now in Newark, half of our students are have chronic or severe chronic absenteeism, which means they miss 10 or more days of school a year. So that means half of our half of our kids are missing 10 or more days of school. Do you have enough information to know the variety of reasons why? Is there any one thing or is it uh, just It tends to be a variety of reasons, but if you look, you know, as I have at National Research or you have conversations with families, which I do every day, it's a range of factors. Some have to do with things in the home, such as I have another child with asthma. When my car breaks down, I don't have a plan B. And those are directly related to the effects of poverty. And we can support those things by connecting families to other families and making sure we ask the right questions. Some have to do with our need, the school system's need to explain to families and help them understand just how devastating the effects of absenteeism is. So when you ask a family, well, do you think it's a big deal for a child to miss a school day? They may not, they may not know that it's a huge deal. So part of it's also um, education. And the third is when students feel like they're missing something, they have, they have a great teacher, they have a club they love, a teacher's going to miss them, a crossing guard's going to miss them, their buddy's going to miss them. When they feel they're missed and that they're going to miss something, they get to school. And so that has to do with all the things we're doing. So right? this, this is very different from the old days when the truant officers would go out and they would round up all the kids who were cutting class, who weren't in school for whatever reason. However, I would imagine that there is an important role in all this for the teacher, for the principal, for those on the ground in the school to recognize this and and facilitate the communication? A hundred percent. So the reason why we spent so much time studying the data and also going out to all of our stakeholders is attendance is one of those things that can only be improved if everyone gets involved. As you pointed out aptly, it is one of those things that we need every single stakeholder in this community to come together if we think we're gonna actually crack this nut and make real progress. So we need families to 
keep up great attendance if they have a young person that has great attendance, to step it up if they don't, and to, to understand the consequences when their young person is not in school. We need them to support other families who might be struggling. We need students, especially our older students, to, to really understand deeply, and that's on us, how much attendance matters in terms of their life goals. We need teachers um, to ensure that obviously their classes are engaging and interesting to begin with, so kids want to be there, but also to be part of the solution. And many of our teachers are. The teachers that go the extra mile, that email the student or text them or try to figure out what happened, this happens already, but we need it to happen systemically. And then with principals, we've helped them to see how to think about and talk about attendance as a leading indicator of health. Attendance is sort of like blood pressure in the medical field. If your blood pressure is not good, typically it means there's a whole host of other things that are not good too. Attendance is the same thing. It is a leading indicator of health or challenges. And it's why we must work on it because when attendance is good, it means we're on the right track in terms of all the other things we need to work on in our schools. This is Newark Today on WBHO and WBHO.org. I want to try and get in at least one more call before we go to the break here. Michael is joining us on the line right now. Michael, welcome to Newark Today. What's your question this evening? Thank you. I have two questions. Um, Just listening to all the dialogue going on right now, uh, my first question is around the teacher's contract. I agree that it was a great contract for the teachers in Newark, but my one question is um, a lot of teachers have been um, getting, from the administrators, they're being told that they have to do certain things that blend into the contract, the, um, the CAP, the Corrective Action Plan, and the, uh, the IPDP, the um, Individual Professional Development Plan. But they're being told to do these things by themselves, which contradicts the, um, the new framework that came out, as well as NJ Teach. So is this coming from you, Cami, or is this just administrators doing what they want to do in their buildings? So you mentioned two, two specific things. The, the Individual Professional Development Plan has been part of statute, and, and really what it is at its core, um, it's teachers identifying with support from their administrators where they're strong and where they need to grow. So it's, it's basically the same thing I require of my senior leadership team, which is, look, tell me where you met your goals, tell me where you're falling short, and then set an action plan about where you need to grow. Um, I think fundamentally that's a task that needs to really involve both both individuals. When teachers drive it, in other words, when they are kind of owning it and leading it, I actually think it's more successful, meaning um, self-reflection and the ability to set goals and how you want to grow is really important. But of course, it must be done in consultation with and in coaching um, with the administrators. So it's, it's definitely a two-way street. And we have done a great deal of training and support of our principals on this. It doesn't mean it's always perfectly implemented. But I'm not sure if Michael's a teacher or not, but if he has concerns about, if he is a teacher, how it's being applied in his own school, mm-hmm. um, is there, can he call you in the district? A- absolutely. So the number I gave earlier is to the soups office, but, but even better is um, the email, which is contact super. So contact super, C-O-N-T-A-C-T-S-U-P-E-R at nps.k12.nj.us. So that emailing, I am in dialogue with a, a number of teachers, and I actually very much welcome questions like this, not just on the radio, but in real time, because, you know, in a big system, we do a lot of coaching and support, but there are times when it's not implemented, at, you know, the way we would like it to be. And frankly, it's helpful to me to get this kind of real time feedback. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. When we come back, more with Newark School Superintendent, Cammie Anderson. City of Newark is launching a campaign to educate residents on how, what, and when to recycle. If your trash collection days are Monday and Thursdays, then your recycling days for paper and cardboard are on Mondays, and for bottles and cans, Thursdays. If your trash collection days are Tuesdays and Fridays, then your recycling days for paper and cardboard are Tuesdays, and for bottles and cans are on Fridays. 
For more information, contact Newark Non Emergency Call Center or go to our City of Newark website. And welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Andrew Meyer. There are a number of ways you can keep up with us, get the latest in what we're doing on the program on the Newark Today Facebook page. And for info about the show and everything we do at WBGO News, you can connect with me via Twitter at Andrew Meyer WBGO. To follow up with what we were talking about, Superintendent Anderson, just before the break, Michael was calling with the question about the uh, how some of the um, uh, issues with the new contract were being applied. And we don't know if Michael's a teacher or not, but we were saying you were saying that if he had concerns, he could get in touch with your office. And there's one other thing you wanted to note, the fact that if he does, nobody's going to know that. Exactly. I mean, we very much appreciate when teachers contact my office with feedback, suggestions, and questions because things get lost in translation. We treat that uh, information confidentially, and we use it as a chance to get better. So we really do appreciate it, and we hope we hear from you. We're going back to the phones now. Joining us on Newark Today is Anika. Anika, welcome to Newark Today. What's your question for the superintendent? Uh, Hello, my name is Anika. I was wondering, what makes you believe that your policies regarding students skipping class will be more effective than those implemented before you? It's a great question. So again, it goes back to doing a host of things right. You know, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that helps, um, you know, with with truancy or absenteeism. So I think what doesn't work, right, is uh, quick fixes. I mean, that that just, you know, the truancy task force and whatnot that the truancy sweeps, it, it may solve the problem temporarily, but again, it doesn't get at the root cause. So I'm hoping that everything we're doing together will be what it turns out to be the the winning strategy, if you will. So it's about kids wanting to be at school. I I, one of my favorite examples, I went as I was at a high school last year and I saw a kid who was clearly about to cut and I was right behind him and the bell rang and he did a U-turn and and started walking very purposefully to a classroom. And I said, where are you going? He's, I can't, I can't miss Mr. Smith's class, he said. And so one thing is ensuring that our classrooms are great, our schools are great. Another is partnering with families. Another is making sure that we have high interest activities that, that kids don't want to miss. Um, another is building student leadership. I didn't mention this, but another part of our strategy and our campaign has, has been training student ambassadors at our high schools and at our K-8s who are essentially serving as campaign managers, if you will, at their schools to promote the, the necessity for attendance and to begin creating a peer culture. So what we're doing that's different is we're saying it's everybody's responsibility and the strategies we're employing are working with every single stakeholder. That's not gonna change things overnight. Our goal is to cut absenteeism in half in the next three years, which will add 1 million hours of instruction. 1 million hours. That is not an easy goal, that is a lofty goal. Um, We will hopefully make progress towards that, but it is my belief that the winning strategy is doing a lot of things right and doing them concurrently, and it will take a while for all of that to have a huge impact. I think some of the struggles of the past, but not just in Newark, nationally, Um, We try one thing, and we know that actually getting breakthroughs in attendance requires doing a lot of things right. I want to get uh, Lisa in on the conversation now. She has a follow-up question concerning attendance. Lisa, uh, welcome to Newark today. Fire away at the superintendent. Hi. um, Good evening, superintendent. Nice to speak with you. How are you? Good. Um, I'm stunned. I did not know the attendance, uh, the absentee rate was so high at 50%. So my question is, if it's so high, then why were the uh, attendance officers um, laid off? So um, the first thing I have to say is that the, that data is actually happened while we had attendance officers, So, and we've had them for a while. The attendance and absenteeism um, issue in Newark, um, just like in lots of urban um, cities, has been chronic for a very long time. What we were able to do this summer is publish a study that helped us to understand specifically how individual kids are doing and how individual schools are doing. So I just want to emphasize this is not a new problem. I think we were just able to do a study to lend some transparency on it. That data actually happened while we had 
a host of attendance counselors. One thing that we have learned through a lot of research nationally and a lot of promising practices is that when you have a situation where folks think it's one person's responsibility, oh, attendance is the attendance counselor's job. That's when you see um, stagnation and some of the endemic issues we saw that have been around for a very long time, including when we had a lot of attendance counselors. I believe that one of the most critical pieces, which I said um, to the previous caller, in our campaign and in our success and in our winning strategy is ensuring that everyone realizes it's a collective action challenge that requires a collective action solution. And so bottom line is we have found nationally and the same was true in Newark, the proofs and the data, that having attendance counselors wasn't working. So we needed to find new solutions. And part of that is um, in working with every single stakeholder. So. I hope that this strategy will will win for our kids. Lisa, thank you so much for your call this evening. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. Less than 15 minutes to go in the program. So if you have a question for the superintendent, we welcome you joining us. Don't put it off. Call us at 1-800-499-9246. 1-800-499-9246. Abdul has been waiting patiently on the line. Uh, Abdul, uh, we will be getting to you in just a little bit. Um, I want to get an email here uh, coming in from Lionel, um, and he goes, Miss Anderson, you mentioned having transformational leaders for each school. What about the preschool age students? Uh, I understand that the preschool child study teams have no supervisor, to use your words. They have no transformational leader. What do you plan to do about this lack of leaderships? since there are so many outstanding issues facing the special education preschool population. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I couldn't be more passionate about special education. Um, I think folks have heard me talk before about um, the fact that in my old district, we had nearly double the amount of special education students than, than the other districts in New York. And in my own family, um, you know, we have a number of individuals who received IEPs, and sometimes that was helpful to their growth and development, and oftentimes it was not. So I have a personal and deep passion around special education. We have um, completely recommitted ourselves to how we work with child study teams. And for those of you who don't know what those are, those are the those are the social workers, guidance counselors, speech therapists, teachers, and, and other individuals who come together to either write an individualized education plan for special education students and or to provide the services and ensure it's working. Those are some of the most important people in our entire system. This summer we did a great deal of training, not just for the child study team members, but for principals and supervisors. It is most critical, as you point out, in in the earliest grades, but it's important throughout. So we've done a lot of work in how we are reforming and shining a light on the need to improve our special education practices, but we have a long way to go. I'll just give you, leave you with this one statistic. In terms of young people who are in most restrictive environments, meaning they, have, um, they are in segregated classes, we are nearly double the state average, which is already higher than the national average. That alone is concerning. We, similar to what I was saying about suspension, we have overrepresentation of African American and Latino boys in special education. All of those tell us that what we're doing in special ed is in need of a great deal of change. And I'll be the first to say, we are at the front end of that process, but we have made great strides and we have miles to go. And this is something that um, I have an extreme passion for personally, and I think we have the right transformational leader on my team, but it will take time for that to ensure that we have the right leaders at every level of the system. We're going back to the phones now. Abdul is joining us on New York Today. Welcome to the program. What's your question for Ms. Anderson this evening? Yes, Ms. Anderson. Uh, the crime in the city of Newark is at an all-time high. The role of tennis counselors, who also was to keep the children off the streets, uh, the school. Uh, now that the attendance council has, and the truant officer has been dismantled, uh, what are your plans for reorganizing this whole thing? And on top of it, another question is this, that uh, there's committees that are being formed right now as we speak. It only took one person to do this job as a tennis counselor when it takes five people to do it. And if you have a plan, exactly what is the plan, and when this plan fails, what do you intend to do about it? 
Thank you very much, Abdul. Well, we've been spending quite a bit of time we have, talking I mean, about the plan this evening. Again, yeah, we have. I mean, I, there are a lot of specifics about the plan, I, and I, respectfully, I, the crime in the city is of deep concern to all of us. Um, uh, sweeps and attendant sweeps and truancy officers have been tried in Newark and all over the country, and um, those those practices were firmly in place over the last few years, and you know don't appear to be all that successful. So. Um, we are um, we are going for a much deeper, much more systemic solution. Uh, it will not solve things overnight, if you will. Um, but I, I do want to point out for for listeners who may not know, um, you know, we had a, a small number of attendance counselors, um, and uh, they were present in the district for many years. And while they were present, we had triple the national average in terms of chronic absenteeism. So what we were doing was not achieving the desired results. And there, this new plan is multi-pronged, as we've discussed, and we have to keep at it until we get it right. We've, we've got to have our kids in schools, and we've got to have them succeeding, and we must do so through all of the strategies we've been discussing. Abdul, thank you so much for your question this evening. This is Newark Today on WBGO and WBGO.org. Going back to the phones now. Uh, Eddie is joining us on the program. Eddie, welcome to Newark Today. Sal, sorry, Sal is joining us on the program. Welcome to Newark Today. Yes, hi, Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Uh, I'm, uh, I, have a, I was a t- uh, an alumnus of Barringer High School, and I taught at the school for 45 years, just retired two years ago. And uh, I, I was kind of ashamed of the way this district handled the school and I don't think a lot of people know that realize that it's the first free public high school in, in New Jersey. As it was formerly Newark High School. It was changed in Newark to, to Barringer High School. And then, uh, and it's the third oldest in the country. And uh, and as I interest, my interest in history, we have a, we have an archive at the school that we we've, we've contained, and now the school has two principals. And it's. I wonder what's going on. Uh, those are the, uh, we, we. I go down to the school at least one day a week with a former principal from from the '60s, and we work in the archives. And I was wondering what the district plans on doing to Barringer and why it hasn't highlighted the. the I understand test scores are, are are important, but why hasn't the history been highlighted or or the school been highlighted as being uh, what it is. So, first of all, thank you for your service. It sounds like you um, had a long and incredible career as a teacher, and, and there is nothing more important to our kids than that. So, for starters, thank you. It is true, Behringer has an incredible history. And the part of the challenge at Behringer has been um, the enrollment has been plummeting over the last three, four, or five years, in part because the performance um, has also been plummeting. So, everything from attendance to um, the number of young people graduating. So one thing we did this summer um, that I'm very proud of, and it appears to be off to a very, very good start, is it's a very big building, beautiful building, historic building with a, you know incredible name that we must promote. And thank you, Sal, for your commitment to doing so. We actually broke into two schools, not changing the name, Behringer is proud and, and and open for business. And what we did is we, we have two principals now that are able to provide more supervision, more leadership, more oversight, and two different themes. So that for young people who are interested in technology and science, there is one um, wing. And for those who are interested in humanities and arts, there's another wing. And of course, there's always the common space that they share. And we did that in part because we are very dedicated to restoring the wonderful name of Behringer and to to turning around the results there because we want Behringer to stay as an icon in this community forever. But right now, families are actually fleeing Behringer and they have been for quite some time on, on some level who could blame them. So our goal is to breathe new life and energy and vision and purpose into Behringer to keep the name alive and to draw families back in so that we can keep open and and keep the great name of Behringer High School for many decades to come. Sal, thank you so much for your call this evening. Going back to the phones now, Eddie is joining us on Newark Today. Eddie, welcome to the program. Let me get you right to your question. All right. Um, first of all, I want to say greetings and thank you for having me. Um, 
Kimmy Anderson. Um, I was listening to the little clip that uh, the host had played earlier, and it said how um, he doesn't really care about when he was talking about renewing renewing your contract. He said he doesn't really care about um, community criticism. Um, I believe that we need community criticism, whether it's good or bad, so you can analyze the situation and see how you want to deal with the process. But my question is, um, I just have one question. I just have one question. And I'm a, and I'm a youth, and I'm a youth, and I'm going to um, Essex County College. Um, my teacher told me about the show. And the question is, well, would you be willing to sit and meet with parents, students, or school staff members to come together and make collective decisions based on what we agreed to be best for all of us? So, in the Eddie, community. so Eddie, I, I, I do that every day, every week, and I'm always willing to meet with um, with students, families and parents. And I um, my response earlier to the clip was I do believe in rigorous debate and rigorous dialogue. And um, on a weekly basis, I have teacher brown bags where I go to schools and invite teachers to have a sandwich with me and listen to them and hear their concerns. I have round tables um, where I invite folks to my office, stakeholders, advocates, um, student leaders. Um, I have uh, monthly sessions where various faith-based leaders come and talk to me. Uh, I have evening events that are open-ended. Um, so I am very committed to doing exactly as you say. I do it all the time and I will continue to do it because I believe that through dialogue and through collective wisdom, we will be better and I will keep doing it. And so um, absolutely, the answer is absolutely. I got 45 seconds here for one last question myself. Several months ago, it was announced by the Education Commissioner that the School Advisory Board was going to be getting some more say in how the district is run. Fiscal control. Were those just words or is that actually happening? So under Superintendent Marion Bolden, there was already in place, um, the, the School Advisory Board currently already gets all of the financial information and analyzes it and votes on it in much the same way that um, a governing board. And so, and I think that's good practice. I'm, I believe that they should have that information and we will continue that information. And I've said from day one that um, it is my obligation and my commitment to work with the school advisory board. They are elected officials who have given of their time, and I will continue to do so. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have tonight. I want to thank Newark School Superintendent Cami Anderson for being with us. Thanks, and we look forward to having you back thank on with you so us much. again I, in the near future. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who called in. It was a real... Um, treat to be able to have this kind of dialogue. I hope we do it in the future. Our crew tonight on the show, on the phones, it's Jim Cromaldi on the board, Jeremy Sterone, and running everything in the control booth, our producer, Monica Miller. Newark Today is a production of WBTO News. You can find a podcast of tonight's show along with past shows on our website at wbto.org slash Newark Today. You can also watch the show on Newark Channel 78 and on our website at wbto.org slash Newark Today. I'm Andrew Meyer. Join us next month for another edition of Newark Today. This is WBTO Newark.